How does a writer create an emotional core for their story where the audience will relate and go on the journey and feel the ups and downs? Um, well, I usually talk about the emotional core as being sort of a, a combination of four components, actually five. So there's a, another fifth stealth element here. Um, so the four that I think um, are involved are the things that basically the character has to prioritize over the course of the story. And the way they prioritize those things, sort of the change in their priorities, shows us the effect that the plot events have had on them, if that makes sense. So they start out um, in a status quo, so they have a, we're, we're just gonna get real technical with it. <laughs> so they yeah, start yeah. out with an inner drive, so some, some sort of inner motivation that's um, causing them to, uh, that's sort of, I take that back, that's, that's motivating their actions in life, right? I'll use my favorite example. So in Die Hard, um, John McClane shows up on page one wanting to fix his marriage. That's what's driving him internally. So we know that he has come to LA, he wants to bring his wife back to New York, their marriage has been uh, sort of struggling, whatever. So we know that that's what's driving him internally. Um, he also has a misbehavior. So some people call this a character flaw. Um, I like to call it a misbehavior because uh, I don't think it has to be objectively negative, right? So it's a, it's a behavior that isn't serving them as well as they think it is, or it's some strategy that they're using in order to pursue that inner motivation, right? So he shows up on page one wanting to um, fix his marriage. And the strategy that he's using for that is by being macho and uncompromising, right? So he's basically a caveman when he shows up. He's like, <laughs> I'm gonna take my wife and drag her back to New York with me, right? That's kind of his attitude when he shows up. So those are the first two elements. That's kind of the character status quo, right? What's motivating them internally and the, the way they're going about getting it, which is really their defining characteristic. It's their misbehavior, right? Uh, and then the other two things are the stakes and, and the goal. And we've already talked about those, so you know what those are very well. So those four things are in play. Um, they're, they're put in play basically in the setup of your story, right? So he shows up on page one wanting to fix his marriage. The way he's going about it is by being macho and un uncompromising. Uh, over the course of act one, terrorists show up and he forms the story goal of needing to save those hostages from the terrorists, right? and one of the hostages is his wife. So that's his story goal. What's at stake? The lives of the hostages, including his wife, right? He really wants to save his wife's life, obviously, because that goes to uh, fixing his marriage. So those four things, these are his priorities when we have completed our setup. As we watch the movie uh, and he, his pursuit of that goal and all of the things that are happening to him as he pursues the goal, all of the complications and obstacles and that main force of antagonism, those things and his, um, the, the plot events that he's um, encountering are forcing him to reprioritize. Now, Die Hard is, is a slightly rare example because um, he, he isn't necessarily forced to re reprioritize by his interaction with the terrorists, but because he goes through this whole experience of potentially losing his wife, right? He, she might die, he might die, they may never be able to get back together and make it work, right? Because that's hanging in the balance, he is forced to have sort of this like come to Jesus moment where he's like, I have been doing things wrong. He says to his cop buddy on the outside, like if I ever get out of here, or if I don't get out of here, tell my wife that I was wrong or that I should have done things differently or something like that. I can't remember the exact dialogue, but it, he has that moment where he admits that he has been going about things the wrong way because he thought he knew the right way. He didn't give her enough credit, right? So he continues through the rest of the plot. And then by the end of the movie, we see how he has prioritized those four things. So he has managed to save the hostages. So he's accomplished the goal. He has protected his stakes because he has saved the lives of those hostages, including his wife. Um, he is going to be able to fix his marriage. We get the sense, right? Because his wife and he have that like moment at the end um, where they're working together, right? And then his, uh, his misbehavior is the last thing that's, that's left that could potentially change. And so by the end of the movie, this may be my interpretation, but I think that he has come to realize that he cannot 
treat his wife like he's a caveman and he's macho and uncompromising anymore. He has to take her needs into account too, her input. She's a smart lady. She's clearly like had this whole career that she didn't need him for, right? So they're more equals than he thought. He doesn't have to protect her all the time. He can let her be a part of their marriage. They can be a partnership. So he has re he has reprioritized those four things. And really what I mean by that is he's he's sort of like, you know, let go a little bit of the macho-ness in order to get the other things, saving his marriage, you know, um, uh, saving the hostages, um, basically that's it, saving the hostages and protecting their lives, right? So the way he re reprioritizes those things shows us the uh, emotional arc and the character arc, right? Now we know how he's changed. We know that he started out thinking he had to be this macho protector, and by the end, he knows that he can actually allow his wife to be a real partner in their marriage, and they can work together and ride off into the sunset together. <laughs> does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Wow. Yeah. That's excellent. <laughs> I don't even remember what my initial question was because I'm like <laughs> still I'm thinking about the movie and... Right, right, and how he yeah. softens a little bit, has a little more humor to him. Right, right, and at the end. Die Hard yeah. is a big action movie, so it's not like he's going to have this, you know, profound like internal change where he goes from being macho to being just a pussy cat who's, you know, not going to stand up to anyone. It's not going right. to be that kind of like one eighty change. But we do see that he has reprioritized those four things, and that's what the question was, which was about the emotional core. So that's what the emotional core. I, it's just a term that I use to sort of encapsulate the character arc and the emotional journey and kind of the um, the takeaway message of the theme all in one because that's really, when we see that character go through this experience and have this particular change or adjustment in attitude, that tells us, that gives us the lesson of the theme. It tells us what's important uh, that we need to know about how to live a better life or be a better person or whatever. And if we look at the stakes too, it's not just the terrorists, but then... The, aren't they like in a very high point on the building? Yeah. It's supposed to be like the Arco building or whatever, the, the yeah. highest one in LA. Yeah. And so there's the stakes of that. How are they going to access this level? And there's different, you know, they're going in the stairwells and things like yeah. that. So that adds. It's the Nakatomi to building. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, okay. in the movie. In the movie, it's the Nakatomi oh, okay, building. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Um, in, it's in Century City. Um, ah. But yeah, so the stakes, well, so the stakes are really the the life of the hostages, right? Including John McClane's wife. So that's that's what he's trying to save. And then he's he we talked about um, stakes and sacrifice. He is sacrificing his own safety in order to protect those stakes, right? Which is, you know, again, story nerd stuff, but valuable to think about because it's like if he was going to risk his life to get his wife out of a parking ticket, we'd be like, that's I'm not, I'm not on board with the story. People would check out, they'd stop reading, stop watching the movie or whatever, right? So the, the stakes and the sacrifice have to really balance. We have to understand how, how they warrant each other, essentially, you know? Well, you say story nerd like it's, like it's a bad thing or you have to <laughs> apologize. Wouldn't, doesn't someone have to really be a story nerd to write well? Because if you're too cool for story, then you're going to ignore a lot of the details and a lot of this parts of this engine, correct? Or yeah, well, I mean, thank you for saying that. <laughs> no, I, I think, so, um, so I like thinking about kind of the, the theory of how, you know, how stories work and all the parts, and I, that's my favorite thing. That's why I do what I do. But I actually think that, um, I mean, yes, is it valuable for writers to understand? Definitely. Um, I don't think everyone is as nerdy about it as I am, but so and and I don't think that's a problem. Uh, I do think a lot of writers come at their stories sort of instinctively and intuitively, and you know we all have kind of that sense of a story, right? Like we all understand beginning, middle, and end, and um, we ha we've had that ingrained in us since we we're kids, and so I think. I think a lot of writers don't need to understand kind of the minutia of all of this stuff as much as, as much as um, I enjoy talking about it, um, because they come at their stories instinctively and they just have a story they want to tell and it can you know they can get it on the page without thinking about stakes or you know sacrifice maybe um, on the first pass right. But where I where I do think it will come in handy is if um, 
if you are struggling to make a story work or s several screenplays work, right? If you're kind of running into the same problems over and over, then I think it's super valuable to look at what is it that I am instinctively not getting, right? Where is that thing happening that's that's not allowing my story to work as well as it could? Uh, and then that's maybe the, the, the part of the story nerd canon to, <laughs> to dive into. Um, just figuring out like, what is the thing that uh, I'm not automatically bringing to the page and, and you know, sort of like understanding that part of it a little bit better and maybe honing those skills. So then the story nerd can take the Rubik's <laughs> Cube apart and have all the pieces down and put it back together, but the, they don't, someone can still configure the, the cube just to have it all the same colors on yeah, each side. And they're like still it. going to be a good... Rubik's cube solver. Right, okay, so they don't have to necessarily pull every little yeah. plastic piece out. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a really good analogy that I had never thought of. Um, but yeah, I think that's true. Like, I really like, and I do think of it in, in terms of like being a mechanic, I really like being able to totally disassemble a story and look at each little part and go, oh, I see what you did there, and I see what you did there, and I see how you're making all of these things work together, and that's really cool, and here's the one thing that's that's knocking, right? Or that's like, I'm actually not a car person, but here's the one thing that is making that funny noise. So let's look at that and maybe talk about why um, the choice that you made isn't as strong as it could be or is getting in the way of something else or whatever it is, right? So um, so I like to be a story nerd because I, I just enjoy it. Um, and I think that I can, sometimes I can help other people understand the one little area that they might not be fully understanding by bringing that to them, but I don't think every writer needs to be able to, you know, understand every single, every single thing that we've talked about today.